Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me a dear, dear friend, a leader in the hospice care field, which is something very important, a leader in the elder care field, Sierra Campbell is the founder of the Nurture Company. You can find this at nurture.co. She has built a site that we desperately needed. It is a site that helps us plan and prepare for caring at the end of life for our own parents. And this is obviously going to set us up, (laughs) set our kids up to care for us. So this is a good sign. It's a really important devolution. And Sierra, welcome, first of all. Thank you, Alina. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Sierra and I met several years ago, what, nine, seven? How many? Yeah, something like that. Something like, something like that. We met on at a yoga glo- a yoga journal conference. And she was doing some work in the filming and I was doing some work in the teaching. And we met and there was an unmistakable connection that has since blossomed into a dear friendship and we are colleagues in many other respects including doTERRA and i look forward to in many ways learning with and from you sierra about all of this and uh, today i'm looking forward to sharing with our listener what what we need to look for in elder care and what nurture.co has for us and what the hospice course that you're designing, Education for Angels, has for us. So I think first things first, how did you find yourself so committed to elder care? You know, I love what you just said earlier about teaching our, our young ones, our children, about how we take care of our parents. That's very much how I got started. My family you know, their belief is we take care of our, of our people. And even with my own grandfather, my mother brought him into her living room for the last six weeks of his life. And we did hospice as a family. Wow. And none of my family actually really under knew how to do all the medical stuff, but you just figure it out. You know, you just, when you're tasked with that, you know, with hospice with someone you love, you just figure it out in the moment. Um, I think I was five or six. I remember going with my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, to visit her friends as they aged. And she would bring them food, bring her rosary, pray over them. And I was like her right arm. She brought me with me everywhere. And um, just I, I just sat with her. I watched her. And I didn't know what was going on until maybe eight or nine. And when she started talking with me about pray with me, sit with me. Uh, And very much this was women's work. This is what women do, you know, back in uh, in her day. She's still here with us. She's 91 years old. Wow. Yeah, she's so healthy. Mopped her floor yesterday. I spoke with her for a while and uh, very active. And I, I really believe that her taking care of others has been so healthy, so much of, it's played such a big role in her health, her wellness, and her mental stability. I think her watching people decline Mm -hmm. probably led her to do lots of things that she might not have otherwise done to uh, expand and increase her own longevity. Yeah, absolutely. I was inspired at 16 to work in a nursing home and it was sad. It was a really kind of a dark environment, um, but there was so much light and love to to be had with relationships mostly with elderly women for me. I I just Mm -hmm. loved and adored these women I got to work with, but the environment was so sad. Some of the, of the nurses were abusive. They were impatient. Uh, And at 16 years old, 
fundamentally, I knew this was wrong and I had no idea. I, at the time, I had no idea at this age of 40, I would still be in this field. Um, but that really set the tone for me in my life of, wow, why are we treating people like this? You know, what, why are we spending so much on uh, the, these kinds of facilities when the care is quite compromised? I wonder, as I think about this, a couple of thoughts just emerged. First, your, as a child, being led around to care for elders at the end of life as though it were the most normal thing created in you an understanding that nobody can ever take away from you. It's almost like, you know, anything a kid is shown early on as important priority is going to be a part of their matrix for their entire life. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just, it's highlighted in my mind right now because I think more of us need to involve our children in difficult things, difficult, sad things. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, often felt like the adult in the room at very young ages because I had already been through so many death and dying experiences, both with my grandmother and then in the nursing home. And we live in a culture right now that's anti-aging, you know, and anti-death, anti-every, anti-wrinkle, anti-real. Yeah. yeah. That makes it hard to face death when it comes, you know, in the dying process. If our focus is to look at aging as though it's a disease, aging is a process. It's a beautiful process. And it really is one that's best embraced, especially when, when we're young and exposing our children to it. So what's your definition of hospice? Hospice is end-of-life care. Hospice is not a place. It's a service. Hospice is often a service where people come to you. It's even in most cases free. And it's because so many people donate to hospice organizations. Um, it's because Medicaid and Medicare often kick in for hospice. Uh, I don't know how long it will be free, but uh, even today, hospice is pretty much free. What's different from palliative care is that palliative is when someone gets a diagnosis, let's say a, a cancer diagnosis, they might be under palliative care for their chronic disease for months or years. Hospice is usually six months or less. A physician will order hospice to the family. And if you need more than six months, that physician just simply sends in another request for an extension and the hospice cover, uh, the hospice services are covered. Got it. It's something that, you know, families will say, oh, I, you know, I hope hospice doesn't come in. Like they want to prolong that, prolong that. I highly recommend to bring in hospice as early as possible when you know the end is near. Even if you think that the end might be within a year or two years, it's time, it's time to start talking to the doctor about it. Tell me more about that. Why, why do you feel it's time to bring it in earlier than we might otherwise? Because these amazing angels will come into your home, educate you and all your family members, and start the process. that They can start the dying process in a very beautiful way. Uh, often, if you wait too long, let's say you, you wait for months or even just weeks, uh, what happens often is hospice will drop off a ton of equipment and say, we'll be back. We'll be back tomorrow or the next day. Well, hopefully they actually do, that they are able to come back in the next day. Because if they don't, then you really have to figure it out on the fly. I volunteer for the visiting nurse services here in New York. And uh, I see this a lot where families are bombarded with all this equipment. So they don't have a lot of education. It's not something you can just pick up in a, in a pamphlet and learn, okay, these, this is exactly what's going to happen with my loved one. Uh, and I need to figure it out in these two weeks, the last two weeks that I have. So the sooner you have the conversations, the more informed you are, the more prepared you are. As a family, uh, not not just for yourself, if you're the one that could be experiencing hospice care, uh, just the machines in and of itself. You know, we think of um, hospice sometimes as less or no drugs, um, 
we think of hospice, uh, actually, how most people will give me kind of their myths when I come in the door as a friendly visitor, and they'll say things like, uh, you know, you're here to give us a lot of morphine, right? And I say, no, you know, hospice, that is a part of hospice, to make the end of life comfortable and easy. So with that comfort and ease, with the morphine comes a lot of machinery for helping respiration, for helping prevent bed sores. Uh, I seriously doubt anyone um, just has one of these mattresses that helps prevent bed sores just laying around in your house. These are things that Sometimes hospice brings, sometimes they don't. But if you've never thought of these things before, it can be very, very stressful when you're already dealing with the emotional weight and heaviness of the loss of someone you love. Yeah, the impending loss. Here's what struck me as you were speaking. I think that actually to invite this education earlier is actually to help not just the family, but also the person who is about to transition off of this plane and onto another, it helps everybody release, like truly release the life, the quote unquote life. Having watched my mom pass, and it was a pretty short window that we had and she was in the hospital the whole time, there wasn't any uh, extended wait, let's say. I remember the moment when she let go And it wasn't the moment of her death. It was like two hours prior. And there was some combination of something my dad said, something my sister then echoed, and then something that I said when both of them had left the room. And I've told this story before. It's it's a little bit weird and slightly off-putting perhaps. But I, when everyone left the room, I got on the edge of the bed, I sort of stood up on the little rail underneath the hospital bed, and I got up pretty high over her face, and I took my little paws and opened her eyes, which were closed, and I, so I could look into her eyes one last time. Mm-hmm. And I said, um, we're all going to be fine. Yeah. All of us are going to be taken care of. Everything is going to be fine. You have done such a good job, woman. And we love you so much and you can let go. You can go. Mm -hmm. And in saying that, you know, sort of like a truncated, abridged version of what I think hospice would have been. I wish I'd had more time, but in saying that I could sense the release. Yeah. And it wasn't just in her, it was in me as well. And that was so helpful. You know, her body was going quickly, but I felt that it was such a help. And I feel like this wisdom that you're giving us is a gift. Yeah, this is, um, ah, I had a, a similar experience with my grandfather's passing. I sat with my grandmother every night till, until two, three in the morning, until she literally would pass out holding his hand. Right. And I said, let's just out loud, let's say, it's okay. We will be fine. I, you know, it's okay to let go. Oh my God, she worked so hard, so much courage to say it. And when she did, he went. And I have seen this dozens and dozens of times in the last 20 20 years of hospice. Our elders will also wait until everyone's out of the room to pass. That's really common. It's because they're still attached too. And that moment when someone will leave to go to the bathroom they're alone, that's often the time that they take their last breath. Every hospice nurse will will remind you of that. They've all experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. Such a big conversation. It is, you know, and hospitals will often have chaplains. And I recently spoke with one. My grandmother had a stroke and she's now recovered. She's at home. But when she was in the hospital, I spoke to a chaplain. I just happened to call at the right time. And he said, you know, I'm just telling her to fight and, you know, go through this. And he, his, all of his energy was about her fighting to survive. And I just said, well, it's okay if she doesn't want to fight. She's 90 years old. Uh, She's fought a lot her life. I think this is a time of surrender and letting go. 
And he was very angry with me. Mm. And I haven't had this experience in a long time. Um, and it was, we had it right. We had this conversation right in front of her. So it was very confusing for her. She said, well, I, I do want to stay for, you know, I have all these grandchildren, but I'm so tired. And so my conversations with her now, I call her almost every day. The conversations are, how are you feeling? How is it to let go? Mm. And just, you know, and not know. She always says, I might not wake up, you know, and she said she's totally at peace. I might not wake up in the morning and it feels fine. I'm ready. And she says it every day. And I, I really believe that's such a healthy way to go through and look at this process, especially when you're 90. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was having dinner. I have a 90 year old neighbor and I was having dinner with her and she's the opposite of that. She's so, um, she's gripping on and not just to her life, but to her opinions and her beliefs and even her negativity. Mm. Yeah, it was really fascinating. I've been sort of hanging out with her for the last six months or so. We go have dinner every few weeks. And this time I I realized there's nothing I can do to change her mind at this time. And she was being mean to a wait person, like a wait staff. And I had to make this call for myself, like, okay, this is going to be the last time I hang out with her for quite a while, if ever, because that for me was really not okay. And not a part of how I want to be spending my time. And she, you know, clearly is not going to change her ways. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that what you're giving is such a sweet gift. And if she were to ever ask for help, I would give it, but I don't think I would give it without a, a worthy inquiry. Yeah, absolutely. And it's when this, uh, when hospice or any kind of care need comes up with our parent, it can be really challenging because we're not going to change them. And having tolerance and acceptance is, uh, is really a practice. And uh, if, you, if you feel like as you approach, you know, we, that moment where we parent our parents, oh, the practice of meditation, of yoga, of cultivating more patience, it's good to get that started now, even if you are going to be dealing with right. life care in 20 years with mm -hmm. your parent, it can be very frustrating. To have a solid basis of your own practice, your own foundation. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what, what do you recommend to those of us who are faced with end of life challenges with our parents or others in our lives, aunts, uncles, whomever, even, you know, siblings or peers? And they don't want to die. They don't want to listen. They don't want to let go. They're not interested in this conversation at all. What, what's your move? Well, the first move is to at least, at least attempt to have some attempt to have the conversation. Just if even if it's lightly, um, and if it's for someone who's very close with you, keep an eye on their health. Keep an eye on the resources that are available to them in their community, everything from adult daycare to actual doctors and therapists that can be helpful to them. You know, as we age, we in essence get blinders, you know, we start really focusing inward. And when I'm talking 75, 85 plus, we really go inward. The process of death and dying is truly one of surrendering and going inward. So as as our elders embark on that journey, very mundane things um, are so helpful for us to keep an eye out for. Like, how are they going to afford the care that they need? Will they be able to stay at home? If they can't stay at home, how and where in the community will they find the next best place, whether that's assisted living? And I, I want to say, if you find yourself looking for care, a facility, Always look for graduated care. The last thing you want to do is move several times as you age. And if you find assisted living and you need more care and you have to move to a long-term care facility, that's two moves you know, from your home to that assisted living. And then from assisted living, again, those are big moves when you're not feeling well, usually in a health crisis, 75 plus years old. So 
one thing, it, it seems so mundane, but actually looking at facilities for even distant relatives, kind of knowing what's available in their community, if they're not going to be able to age in place, is incredibly helpful. These facilities, especially the really good ones, have a wait list that can be two years. So you might find a place and literally have to put your name on a list and wait two years. Most people move when they fall and break a hip or have a health crisis, come out of the hospital after surgery or pneumonia, and they realize, oh, I just can't manage this house anymore. Oh, I just can't, can't do this. And so those of us that are young and on the outside, it's hard to have those conversations, but what we can do is kind of set, set up some things on the outside of their life. I've put the names of people in my life on a wait list. They don't even know. If they need it, their name's on that list you know, uh, for a facility. So it's, it's really looking ahead, looking kind of beyond uh, what they're capable of. No one wants to think about, oh, one day I'm probably going to fall or have pneumonia and I'm going to have to make all these changes in my life. Right? And that's, that can be one of the, the absolute hardest conversations to have when your parent's stubborn and they don't want to move at all. They, don't want to, they think they're going to be independent forever. Right. Sometimes you kind of you have to go around their back, but you have to really surround and embrace them with some options and look beyond what they're capable of, of looking at in the moment. Brings me to two questions. You said graduated healthcare. Yeah. What does that exactly mean? That feels important to me. Yeah. Graduated care is assisted living. Typically some, um, you can move beyond now. Assisted living is usually three meals per day, a really wonderful community environment. Um, a lot of people just don't want to move, right? Nobody wants to move. And who wants to live with a bunch of strangers you've never met before? But the statistics show that with really good facilities that have great social events, exercise, healthy food, the social isolation that the elders leaving from living at home alone is completely playing a huge role in their health. So they find themselves three months in at a facility and their health starts to improve, their mobility increases. So these facilities, elders can push really hard that they don't want to do it, but they can actually be very, very good for them. So assisted living beyond that is long-term care and graduated care, which means nursing staff, caregivers on site, therapists, rehabilitation after surgery, everything you'll need in one place. Got it. That, that, is, that is graduated care. Okay. So we're looking basically, let's say... Uh, our listeners have a parent who's 70 years old or 75 years old. They're, they're not needing the care right now, but it seems like, you know, maybe in the next 10 years, let's be honest, right? Mm -hmm. You would recommend, well, there are a couple of things. First, nurture.co allows us to learn in real time online how to create the conversations that we need to create a plan. Yes. So before I say what you should, you would recommend, like go put your parents on a waiting list that isn't even remotely close, <laughs> like let's hang on for a second. Right. Nurture.co, we click on create your plan and we have conversation one, identify your care circle. This network yeah. should consist of like advocates, family, friends, professionals. You're identifying the support network for the parent, not just you, but also the other people that are around to support this person. That's important. Yes. Who are the people that are going to be there to take your parent to the doctor or home from the hospital when you can't be there? That's conversation one. And it's really just getting with your parent or your loved one and saying, this is maybe a hard conversation. I would rather start having it little bits at a time because in 10, 15 years, I don't want to wait. I don't, I want to design toward this plan we, it's inevitable. And it starts with acknowledging that I'm here for you. I'm one of your people. I'm an advocate. And, you know, let's just start by acknowledging who else is in the care circle. They could be neighbors, they could be friends, and eventually they might be hired staff, right. caregivers, nurses, home health aides. Right. Okay, good. That makes sense. And the next conversation is all about their health care. 
And so what I've given on the site is what I've used for years. For 10 years, I had a home health care agency and I managed health care for 25 to 30 elders per month consistently for those 10 years. And when the Google Drive came out, Oh, it was a godsend. I could share everything easily, quickly, not have to print everything. And so I've put everything in this Google Sheet for families to take. They can download it and put it back in their Google Drive. And it starts with the advocates. And the next conversation is about healthcare. And it's about who are their doctors? Because if they have a health crisis and you have to rush to be with them, it's going to be much easier for you if you have some information about who their doctors are and what's going on, which meds are they taking and kind of becoming involved in that process to the degree that you're able. It's the same thing you would do if you want to get smart about your finances. Yeah. If you want to get smart about your living, what, you know, will and testament, trust, whatever you have, have it all in one place, organize yourself before you need to. You got it. That's exactly what it is. Conversation three is the living will, advanced directives. And you must absolutely have that conversation, uh, if you can, 10, 10, 15 years out about how will we afford care? How are we going to, how, how are we going to manage this as a family? Are you going to live at home? Are we going to hire caregivers? And you have to know what's in the bank to know how, how together that plan comes to be. And it's so different for everyone. Um, that's really the conversation 10 years out. That is not one, something you want to go through in a health crisis. Um, yeah, yep. I'm just realizing I need to have this right now with someone in my life. Um, okay, so that's conversation three, understanding your care needs and your financial resources. Conversation four, define lifestyle. In this conversation, you say the focus is not only on the parent's pathway to a good death, which is so paramount to everything else, but also on the quality of life through the process for you, the caregiver. Yes. So this conversation involves to talk about your, like the person reading the website about to take care of your parent. We want to talk about your finances and affording the various options of care over a long period of time. This is where I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. A long, gosh, probably 10 or 15 years ago, a really good friend of mine said, make sure, had to be longer than that, make sure your parents have long-term health care insurance. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? And he was like, just listen to me, girl. (laughs) Get it? And make sure that you're saving at least 10% of your money, every dollar you you earn. Mm -hmm. Best advice I ever got in my life. Thank you, Kenny. (laughs) And... Please talk to us about what this means. What is long-term healthcare insurance? Why should every single one of us get it now for our parents? Not necessarily we're paying for it, but make sure that they have it. And how does it help? Okay, so first off, I want to say jury's out on how helpful long-term care insurance will be for people beyond 65 right now. So if I were thinking of buying it for myself, if I were in my 50s or early 60s, um, I would do a lot of research on it. Okay, so what it is, is you pay in anywhere from 500 to 2,000. I have some friends in my life who pay $2,000 per month for their future of potentially needing this long-term care insurance. Uh, I think it's, it's fantastic for people who are 70 plus right now who've been paying into it uh, because they are definitely going to use it. They're going to need it. And what they've been doing is they've, pay, they've been paying in since they were in their 50s. And now that they are in their 70s and they may or may not ever use this policy, right? So they have paid, in some cases, over $100,000 into their long-term care insurance. What that means is that when they need home health aides to come into their home to provide care, that they get to age in place in their home and that care is completely covered. Now there are different levels of coverage and these policies change over time. And this is something, a great question, Elena, about having the conversation 10, 15 years before you think you might need it. 
it's really, really good to look at what your parent has signed yep. and how their their interest, not the interest, their their deductible might vary. It might vary greatly. So it's good to get in there and help manage these things so that they don't manage you later. And this is a big one, the, the long-term care insurance. Yeah, it gives me pause. I want to make sure that my dad's sorted out. Mm-hmm. Conversation five is around dignity and death. Yeah. This one is, uh, it's, um, for me, it's, it's everything. Uh, we rarely get to have this conversation ahead of time because so many people just don't want to think about death until they quote have to, right? And so their de- deepest, dearest wishes may not be kept because they didn't share them with anyone. And so this is a conversation that I like to look at the fifth conversation as one that you might revisit and come back to. Of course, all of them are that way. But the fifth one, you know, it's really thinking about what would I like during that time? Would I like people to read me poetry? If so, what is that poetry? So that the room is full of those poetry books. And really exploring what are my deepest desires as I face the the end of my life, or as I like to call it, my new beginning. So this is a, a conversation that weaves the voice of the elder into their death and dying experience. Right. And this can be facilitated by a therapist, or it's you know just a conversation you walk right into and sit mm-hmm. down with your loved one and say, this is, a, we don't have to think about this for very long. But there will be that time when all of your energy is surrendering, your eyes are closed, and I'll have to open them to look inside. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what your desires are during that time. Right. This is beautiful. Beautiful. Nowhere else have I seen this laid out for people for free. Wow. Yeah. You know, one thing about hospice uh, and that it's free, what I love so much about it is that when I show up for a voluntary friendly visitor, uh, you know, just show up, your presence is enough. That's really one of the best things about hospice. It teaches you how powerful just your presence is. But then a family member will say, you're doing this for free? What? Well, I want to do it too. After all, like, and they always say this, every family I have ever worked with that in a voluntary setting, they say, oh, I can't believe it. And it's because the process is so overwhelming. If you've never been through it before, it, it can just shake your whole foundation. And when you have someone there who has been through it, who knows this beeping machine, how to shut it off or how to, how to use something correctly or how to keep the dying person more at peace, they want in and they want to give back. And so it's this beautiful cycle of reciprocity uh, that Mm -hmm. I I just love, you know, people want to jump in and, um, and hospice programs are so good and nurturing for you. I've, I've I've done about five in various cities I've lived in. Mm -hmm. It's, they take you deep into self inquiry and to really knowing you have to think about what, if I were given a diagnosis right now, how would I plan my end of life? Wow. And I love, I love this practice because it's, there's so much hesitancy, right? I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to talk about that with strangers in this hospice room, but I've done it. And it is powerful because if you're going into hospice and you haven't really thought about your own end of life, then it could rock you, right? You, you know, so these really, really good hospice programs will make you think about these things for your own self, your own life, your loved ones. And uh, it's very transformative. You too have a hospice course on nurture.co. It's called Education of Angels. Yes. If you click on uh, hospice course, when you open nurture.co, hospice course is all the way to the right on the nav bar. And I, first of all, would like to learn about your course. And second of all, I would like to learn about the uh, your influences, who has touched you, who has guided you, who has influenced your journey to create this for us? Yeah, great question. My particular hospice course, Education for Angels, starts with 
a little intake. I want to know what hospice means to you and how I can support you in the journey of hospice. Uh, so it's, it starts that way. And um, it's free. It will be kept free and online. And it's a three-week course that you do at your own pace, your own time. My biggest influences have been Stephen Levine, Stephen and Andrea Levine. They have they wrote a lot of books about grief and death and dying. And I went out in the early 2000s to a retreat in New Mexico. And really, they were the only people at the time that I, you know, that I could find <laughs> who had books out and that had made this their life. And through Stephen's work, I was introduced to Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg. And um, one of my biggest influences personally was meeting a Tibetan monk, Jamyang Lama, in Bloomington, Indiana. And he's the abbot of a very large monastery there. And I wasn't raised Buddhist, I, and I don't really consider myself a Buddhist now. Uh, but Jamyang was immediately a friend. We spent, you know, I, he doesn't have a driver's license and I was kind of his, his chauffeur for the first few years of our friendship while I was in my undergraduate. And I, he taught me so much. He taught me how to meditate. He helped me overcome a lot of health challenges that I was facing through really looking at the nature of my own mind. And then when I, I started at 21 years old, a uh, home healthcare agency, his support and that of the the Buddhist community of making sense of the end of life, the process, the emotional weight. Um, I worked in it every day, you know, I, 6 a.m. until 2 p.m. I worked with clients and then I'd take a break and often come back in the evening when I had clients who were facing their new beginning, you know, and most of my work, strangely, was with the family when it came to hospice time. Like you said earlier, Elena, the kind of unfinished business, the stress of the family, siblings who hadn't spoken to each other in years or decades were coming together to be at the bedside of their loved one. That's where I actually took a very protective stance because I had, I had had the elder under my care typically two years before their end of life. And I wanted them to have the absolute best end of life experience. I wanted them to die well. And sometimes their family worked strongly against that. And um, what do you do in those cases? In many cases, I, I would become very bossy. <laughs> I would. Oh my God, I have to see that. <laughs> I would, I would, you know, like just like two kids, two toddlers that are bickering over over something. You know, you just at some point have to say, sit down, apologize, have forgiveness. We're going to sit here and we're going to look into each other's eyes until we can let this go. Have forgiveness and be present for the person that we all love that's in the next room, and in some cases in the same room, right in front of us. Wow. And I just, uh, in some ways, used a little force that this is the time we're doing this now and look into each other's eyes. Let's do this. Hmm. Come over here and tell me what to do. <laughs> That's so beautiful. No, honestly, this is so needed. Yeah. But, and this is all, may I just put the highlighter pen on the fact that this is all voluntary, dude. It's, it's all voluntary. It is. Bless you. Bless you. My last couple questions. You are very committed to creating space for this very positive end of life experience. I know that you're also very studied in yoga philosophy and you've talked about how the eight limbs of yoga um, apply to the death and dying process. And I thought, you know, I have a fair number of listeners who are also yoga practitioners and would you mind if you if you can and you can totally just say let's move on to the next question but can you talk to us about how the eight limbs apply to the death and dying process yeah oh, it's uh oh this is one of my favorite things to talk about the eight limbs if you're on them if you know them and they're part of your life you know about the very the very simple ones, which are just right and wrong, 
you know, ahimsa, doing no harm and really thinking about the things that we do, we do to ourselves and others. Okay, that, that's a phase that we go through at the end of life where people contemplate who they hurt, how they hurt themselves, all the, the decisions that they've made to kind of land where they've landed at the end of life. So they start thinking there's, there's this phase of right and wrong and deep forgiveness. But when you go into the surrender, the process of surrender and letting go, that's where my yoga practice helps me tremendously. If you really practice, and I know you practice so beautifully, and you share it so wonderfully, Elena. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, showing up is such a wonderful teacher. The process of dying each time you're in your yoga practice is something very important to me. The, this process of letting go of what no longer serves the greatest and highest good. Right? And really being able to develop that practice of knowing what's not serving me. I don't need this. Yeah. Yeah. And ahimsa is actually... For the listener who doesn't actually know what the word means, it's really a way of saying nonviolence, but I love Richard Freeman's definition. It's a way of welcoming back into your heart the, the people and the situations that you've cast out for whatever reason. And it feels like at the end of life, there is this element of, I have to, I have to stop being so rigid and start this process, as you said, of forgiveness before it's over. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen when other people are passing that the first thing that comes to my mind is I see them in the final hours of their lives. I see the forgiveness emerging, bubbling up, you know, unconditionally, mm -hmm. because that's something that sort of needs to be, it, it's like an imperative before you let go of the, of the suit, of the body, you know? Yeah. That's ahimsa. Ahimsa, yes. Yeah. Part of the ama. And the second, lem niyama, self discipline. When someone yeah. is in their dying process, the, mm -hmm. uh, when they have the ability to observe what's happening to them and be unattached in many ways, the process is usually much easier. They are able to let go of their suffering and see and know. Their more spiritual self. This is uh, this is a big one in the dying process. Yeah. And pranayama. Oh, if you've ever been with someone who is in the last twenty four to forty eight hours, the breath in the body. They once the spirit has has moved on, like you said with your mother, you you knew that actually happened hours before she took her last few breaths. The body has a way of just working with the breath as, that, as the spirit is lifting. And with practitioners who've been doing pranayama for one to two years before their passing, I've noticed there is much less cathartic, big movements with the body, almost out of control movements. Uh, which is very, you know, that's common. The, the, the body just sort of deals with the lack of breath and there can be shaking. The body can make loud sounds with, with breathing. This practice of pranayama to really control the breath, it gives the, the person who's dying, if they're practicing that regularly, more capacity to be in control, control of their thoughts and their breath during their dying process. That is powerful. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I, I want to ask what breath practices you would recommend for somebody who is, I don't know, let's say six months or two months away. Mm -hmm. if, if anyone is listening to us who has a parent who's close to the end, I want to know what some recommendations are for breathing practices. Yes, I love that. The exhale. It is... The key, you want to work with the elder to just really focus on the exhale and pause and hold the breath for as long as possible. So it's really kumbhaka. It's just holding the breath. That's the practice for end of life. 
And for those of us who are young and healthy and just want to have this kind of brain health, this preparation for letting go, for death, for dying, for surrender, extending the the pause between breaths is one of the most powerful practices I have found. And it's the same if you're teaching someone who's preparing for death and dying, extending the space between inhale and exhale. So you're holding the breath after the inhalation or the after the exhalation? Both if you can. If you know someone is in the last six months, a year, or they're just maybe overwhelmed with physical you know, hardship, pain, or discomfort, focusing on the out breath and pausing for 10, 15, 30 seconds before taking an inhale. Interesting. I see why that would help. And I've, I've also noticed there, there's a correlation between how people feel about holding their breath and their fears about death and dying. Tell me more. What do you mean? In general pranayama classes in yoga, you know, not with the dying, but just teaching yoga, I have found, I, I always ask, I, I like to do breath holds in classes that I teach and I love getting feedback of how does it feel? And if it's really stressful for someone, I'll usually ask one-to-one and not in the group, but I'll ask, you know, is, is the conversation of death and dying, does it ever come up in, in your life? Do you, do you fear it? Do you even fear the conversation? And I get a strong yes from people. And it's um, something to explore. So if you notice that it's so uncomfortable that you feel like you've got to take a breath, you just can't hold it, no way. Really listen to that. Listen to your body and understand what else it's telling you. It's funny. I remember uh, in the last few moments of my mother's life, she it, it was hard for her to let go. It really was. And uh, that last breath, I think we all, my dad was holding her hand. I think he had one cheek, my sister had the other cheek, and I had my ear on her belly. Mm. It was so beautiful. And you could hear it when the last one left. Yeah, that's so- It's a very holy time. Listener, if you're listening and this scares the shit out of you, please know this end of lifetime that we're speaking of is so holy. If you haven't been privy to it yet, it's one of the holiest times of your whole life. In, in a way, uh, I'm not going to cry again, but in a way, it was more holy than when my son was born. And that was holy, like one of the best moments. I still get all chills when I think about him in my arms for the first time. Watching my mother pass was one of the most sacred experiences of my whole life, if not the most. And to be present and not fearless, but prepared yeah. is why I wanted to have you on the podcast, Sierra. It's, it's one of the most important gifts we can give to ourselves and to those we love. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And in, in closing with yoga, pratyahara, dharana, totally going inward all the way into samadhi. These are practices uh, that we get in yoga and they're amazing. And if they sound like, what? This is a foreign language. Um, It is a foreign language and it's worthy of of giving it a shot. You know, meditation can Mm -hmm. be really frustrating. I get it. Um, But it's really worth uh, sticking with your practice. And maybe even after, you know, if you're new to meditation, after you've done some asana, your body's opened up. Keep exploring a lot of these things of drawing your senses inward and really listening, deep listening, going deeper than the inner ear and then moving beyond even the five senses. It takes a long time in practice. I've been practicing yoga for about 20 years and these things didn't click for me for quite a while, years, years into the practice. You know, sometimes felt like I'd think, what is the, what, what are these things? I, they can seem very out there when they're these very subtle experiences. And uh, I know you know them very, very well. I mean, for years, all of us, I, I, for, for myself, for years, I was just like, why am I actually doing this? Mm-hmm. I know it feels good after, but what really, why am I doing this? And now I've come to understand through my study with Rod Stryker and through all of the, all of these conversations, all of these experiences that I've had at people's final hours, 
this is really about a practice, yoga and pranayama, this is in meditation, this is really about a practice that actually improves the quality of our death. It's not actually about improving the quality of our life. Yeah, these are practices to prepare us to have the best death possible. Yeah. It's funny when you say best, the most intentional, would you say? Yeah, the most intentional, most uh, uplifting, most... Mm -hmm. um, sacred sacred heartfelt yes compassionate yes. yes that's nice yeah and i guess that's all we have in the end really is just to prepare for that in the best way that we possibly can and live every day in the best way that we possibly can with as much compassion and uh kindness as we can you've got it and when we have these conversations about death and dying with those we love it really does inspire us to live this life more fully. Usually, if you know, if you feel hesitation around something or fear, um, there's something there for you to learn and to grow from it. And these conversations can be challenging, but wow, they are so worth it. Yeah. And there's lots of support. You'll be surprised if you if you're not having these conversations because you're scared and there aren't people there for you. There really are. There are lots of people to talk to about this process of grieving and even anticipated grief, right? The, the grief of just thinking about the person we love, thinking about the end of their life, even if that life is 10 years away. That's real. That's real. And I, I am so grateful when my friends bring it up with me and talk about it because these things are real and they, they just create so much more energy and availability, capacity to love and to live more when we discuss them. Yeah. What is the poem that Mary Oliver uh, wrote about being 60 and her, oh, it's just such a, I wish I had it. I'm going to see if I can find it. I'm Now I'm 60 and it's still the same. It's in her book. It's sort of a square book. It's a small sort of workbook, but it's one continuous poem and it has yellow on the top and purple on the bottom. I have it in my bookshelf and it's over there, but I can't get up from my seat. I wish I could get it and read. You know what? Maybe I will. Okay. It's from the leaf and the cloud, which is a book in and of itself. I have a couple things I want to read here. Death whoever and whatever you are tallest king of tall kings grant me these wishes oh, so good unstring my bones let me be not one thing but all things and wondrously scattered shake me free from my name oh. so good let the wind and the wild flowers and the catbird never know it let time loose in me like the bead of a flower from its wrappings of leaves let me begin the changes i'm going to find the one that i wanted to read to you it's too long to read it's called work mm. it starts like this i am a woman 60 years old and have no special courage Every day, a little conversation with God or his envoy, the tall pine, or the grass-swimming cricket. Every day, I study the difference between water and stone. Every day, I stare at the world. I push the grass aside and stare at the world. The spring pickerel and the burn and shine of the tight-packed water, the sweetness of the child on the shore, also its radiant temper, the snail climbing, the morning glories carrying his heavy wheel the green throats of the lilies turning from the wind. This is the world. Comes the hunter under the red leaves, come the hounds on their stubbies. Like wind, they pour through the grass. Like wind, they pour up the hill. Like wind, they twist and swirl in the long grass. Every day I have work to do. I feel my body rising through the water, not much more than a leaf. And I feel like the child, crazed by beauty or filled to bursting with woe. And I am the snail in the universe of the leaves, trudging upward. I am the pale lily who believes in God, though she has no word for it. And I am the hunter, and I am the hounds, and I am the fox, and I am the weeds of the field. I am the tunnel and the coolness under the earth. 
I am the paw print in the dust. I am the dusty toad who looks up unblinking and sees. Do you also see them? The white clouds in their blind, round-shouldered haste. I am a woman 60 years old, and glory is my work. So good. Oh, I have so many tears in my eyes. This one just keeps going on and on and on. Mm -hmm. the, way she, the way she wrote, God. A leaf in a, the Leaf in the Cloud is one of the best books. If you um, are sitting by somebody's yeah. deathbed, final hours, this is one of the ones. You have a resources page on nurture.co, and you included devotions, which is basically Mary Oliver's best of. Mm -hmm. Super perfect, also, recommendation. I wonder if it's even in there, The Leaf in the Cloud. In any case... I'm so thankful. I'm just so thankful for the tears in my eyes, for all the ways that you're teaching me, for all the ways that your work, Sierra, please know this, your work is absolutely critical to us right now in this time. Please don't stop. Not stopping. Good. <laughs> <laughs> On a mission. Not stopping now. It's been two decades. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. Honestly, I don't hear this conversation. It's not being had, and we desperately, desperately need to be having it out in the open. I have to have it right now with James and his mom. You know, it, it's it's crucial. I want to have it now with my dad. He's only 74, and he's in perfect, robust health. But, you know, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it now. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. And I am grateful I will be there to support you through that. It's, uh, I, I feel very blessed that at this point in my life and career, I can offer a lot of things for, for free. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah. And we, we need to have this conversation. Thank you for having me, Elena. Yeah. No, thank you so, so much. I am, um, I'm only going to ask you one of the three questions that I ask all of my guests or most of my guests. The one question is, what does prayer mean to you? Prayer to me is surrender. So a surrender to unconditional love with the intention for compassion to grow. And so that, that surrender looks different for all of us, but I think we, we all know what unconditional love feels like. There's someone in our life who has extended that to us. And that to me, the energy of that, the essence, is prayer. It's very much an energetic experience for me, prayer. I've practiced Reiki for 20 years, and I love the power of visualization. So prayer for me will often involve visualization and light and that beautiful essence of compassion, of unconditional love. Thank you, my sister. Thank you so much, and I love you. Love you, too. Thank, Thank you. you.